The Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District is a self-governing advisory agency with diverse in-house expertise in the area of conservation of natural resources. Some of our tasks include reviewing development-related applications, conducting watershed management educational programs like stream monitoring, and other public presentations like the one that we have today on backyard chicken management. The Soil and Water Conservation District is responsible for the implementation of the agricultural portion of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Program for Fairfax County. And today's speaker is one of our key staff. Our speaker today, Willie Wood, is originally from Sierra Leone, West Africa, and has been a staff of Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District for over 30 years. He holds a Master of Science in Environmental Technology and Management with an emphasis on soil remediation. He works with our equine community and urban agricultural sector, including backyard chicken operations. In his spare time, he enjoys gardening, native plants, and nurturing wildlife enhancement. And with that, I'll turn our presentation over to Willie so he can begin. Okay, thank you, Ashley, and thank you to all for joining us this afternoon. And so in the spirit of growing locally and eating locally, the interest of growing backyard, of, growing home, of having homegrown gardens and having backyard chickens is also grown significantly. As, as such, we thought it was in place for us to just talk to everyone about this specific practice of backyard chicken management. I know we have some people with us today who may be thinking about having chickens in the backyard. We have others who already have chickens in the back and looking to improve on their practices. And we have, may have other neighbors who are just concerned about a neighbor having chickens in the backyard. And today we may also provide some answers to that neighbor's concerns. So by the end of this program, I hope we would have been able to touch on things like how to get started, Fairfax County's zoning and permit requirements for backyard chickens, caring for your chickens, waste management and pollution prevention, which is a big thing, common diseases and biosecurity issues, afterlife decisions, and also questions and answers for specific interests. Now, as we know, there are many different types of breeds of chickens, and geneticists have convinced us that all those breeds of chickens come from this ancestral red jungle fowl. So over, the, over many years, hundreds of years, chickens have undergone genetic uh, um, alterations to be able to provide the needs of man. As we know, Chicken is the highest source of protein eaten by us, and eggs play a significant role in our breakfast, lunch, and even dinner. So in the process of wanting to have chicken, you probably want to stop, first stop and think, what do I hope to gain from having chicken in my backyard? Do I want to have meat? wherein you can grow your own chicken, have a plump chicken dinner for yourself and your family and your friends. Make that you know you, you were there when the chicken grew and you knew what the chicken ate, etc., etc. Well, the breed of chicken that, that produces meat are referred to as broilers. One such breed is the red ranger. These are chickens that eat and consume and converts most of the feed into tissue. And they even have the potential to get to about four to five pounds in just eight weeks. They move slowly, so the meat is usually very tender. Others may be interested in just having eggs for breakfast or giving your neighbor some eggs or giving eggs as a, as a gift to a friend or family member. And those breeds that are usually high in egg laying process are referred to as layers. An example of one such breed is the Bar Plymouth Rock. This is the egg, this little chicken that produces a lot of eggs per year, and it doesn't grow its tissue as fast because most of this energy is converted into egg production. 
Now, the geneticists also have a hybrid grid they refer to as dual grid. These are chickens that have the potential to grow their meat at a relatively reasonable rate and at the same time produce relatively high number of eggs. And they refer to them as a dual grid. One such example is the Rhode Island red. Yet there are those who would like to have chickens not so much for the meat or the egg, but just to have a partner with them. And that is also so nice. Now, if you remember, if we do a throwback, you'd remember that last week we talked about bees, having bees in your backyard. So just keep in mind that bees and the chickens also go well together. But before we get too excited about what we'd like to have our chickens in the backyard for, Let's stop and think. Can we legally have chickens in our backyard? So there are rules that govern these things, keeping animals, in if you live in Fairfax County. Before I even say anything, I must first make it clear that I'm not an expert in the ordinances that govern keeping chickens or animals in your backyard. However, the Fairfax County Zoning Ordinance Section 2512 governs and talks specifically about all of these areas of keeping animals in your backyard. I'm going to attempt to just touch on a few uh, um, regulations or ordinances that actually govern whether you can and under what conditions you may have chickens in your backyard. The first portion of the ordinance I want to just highlight to you is keeping of commonly accepted pets as accessory use on any lot size is allowed. This includes domestic chickens under two months. Let's look at the keywords here. It says keeping of commonly accepted pets for your personal enjoyment, but not for commercial use, is allowed on any lot size. However, those chickens must be under two months old. So let's think about it. Who wants to have chickens that are less than two? Now, the next portion of the, of the ordinance we need to talk about is the case of the domestic chickens, when they're two months old or, or older, you're required to have them on a lot size of, at, that is at least two acres in size. Now, if you don't have two acres and you, and you want to have chickens, then there are other conditions that come into play. Of course, it also says that even when you have two acres in size, there are restrictions as to the density you may have, which is referred to as the bird unit per acre. And what that says is about 32 chickens per acre is the guideline that you would need to have if you want to have chickens in your backyard. But if you don't have the two acres, if you want to have more than 32 chickens per acre, all is not lost because you can also pursue the possibility of getting special permit to the Board of Zoning Appeals, which is referred to commonly as the BZA. Finally, it says that roosters are only allowed in agricultural environment. That is when you have five acres or greater and you have agricultural use either as an accessory or as a buy right permit. As I mentioned before, I'm not an expert in this. I just want to throw this point out so we can have something to consider. Uh, but if you have some specific questions, do not hesitate. You can contact the Fairfax County Code Compliance at 703-324-1300, where you can have also have a telephone tip assistance with the code 711. You may also go to the website and um, read up some more about the conditions and govern having chickens in your backyard. An overarching condition that one, that's worth noting under this ordinance is before you even apply for a permit, you would need to contact or consult your home and association to find out if they allow you to have chickens in your backyard because that those bylaws um, surmounts the conditions of the zoning ordinance. The first thing you want to do is consult with your home and association and your neighbors as well, just to be a good neighbor. And then you can move on to these conditions that we just mentioned. 
So now let's say we have the authority, we have the right, we can legally have chickens. Where do we start? You can get chickens from a lot of sources. You can get these chickens from the, from the approved hatchery. You can get it from a chicken farm. You can get it from a friend. You can get it from Craigslist. But we usually, the district encourages you to consider getting your chickens from an approved hatchery. That way you know what you're getting. There is no guessing about it. You can get the exact sex that you're looking for because you know that in Fairfax you can't have a rooster. Um, so it's good to go through the hatchery and get them young. When you get them young, you can train them and grow the way you want them to grow. Prior to getting those chickens, there's some things you must have in place before they come home. They can get home, get to you as early as a day old, in which case you need to have a specialized a, a brooder. Brooder is just a secure air where you can keep your young chickens with some heating going on. So because the chickens are young, they need some, they still need some water. So the picture you see here is just a brooder that's created in your house, in your house with some a protective cardboard with feeding and the drinking amenities within their reach and a heat lamp that keeps the, warm, the, the chickens warm. No sooner those kids, chickens get to about four to five weeks, they become really, they grow fast and become really frisky, and you should be ready to start transitioning them into a more permanent coop. You also need to have some of those facilities in place before your chickens come home. And as I mentioned, feeders, watering, what drinking facilities, feed, and the protection you would need to keep them safe from, uh, um, from just straying around. There are various types of chicken coops, and I will show you just a few and try to point out the advantages to you so you know what to, what to, what to know when you're looking for your chicken coop. One common thing they always talk about is for easy maintenance is to get a coop that you as a human being can walk into and out quite easily. That helps greatly when it comes to cleaning the coop because cleaning a coop is very important. But besides the human requirement, a chicken coop should have an egg box, which otherwise called a laying box. It should be well ventilated. Look at the back, you will see the vent at the back. It should have a um, walkout area to be protected from extreme weather conditions. And internally, there are other things that we'll talk about when we look at the inside of the chicken. But this is just one model of a chicken coop that may cost you about $500 if you want to have someone build it for you. But you can also make your own and there are various types. Here's another one called the igloo. Igloo is one that is also very fancy, and you can see it does have the protection for the chickens. It has it has a run, an outdoor run. It has a shade in case it's sunny. It has a good breeze that could blow through and keep the air well aerated. Drinking and feeding troughs, and of importance is the perimeter a protection you see around the run, which keeps wildlife from being able to borrow a big aim to come get your chickens while your back is turned or at night. Here's another type of, of chicken coop. This is very locally made, using milk crates or cottons, overturned milk crates, and then a, a, a just a piece of plywood on top of it, held down by just pieces of cinder blocks, and then you have remnants of lung fence around. Then you have a, um, roost, a roosting bar there for the chickens. You have the water, you have the, the feed container. Then you have dirt for them to have the dirt bath. So this is a very local thing that you can do for yourself. It'll cost you very little or nothing with things that you have on your property. This is a setting where we know you can have chickens. Chickens are usually Good to have in groups and you know when you want to have chickens don't say well i'm going to start with one and see how it goes it's advisable to have a minimum of three chickens to start with and also advisable to start with as many chickens as you think you would want keeping in mind that they may not all make it unfortunately keeping in mind that wildlife might get one or two of them the reason i say it's best for you to actually start with a number you would like or even higher is because once you have your your chickens together they have their pecking order as they say in other words a hierarchical structure it's hard to introduce another chicken halfway through the life cycle because
because the difficult time where fighting can take, checking can take place sometimes get very serious. So it's good to have as many as you want, and so, so they can all live, live together. Additionally, keep in mind they have a nice open grass area that can roam around. You can see their, their chicken coop in the background, and these are happy, healthy chicken. Next thing you want to think about and be very careful about is inference of wildlife. There are raccoon, there are foxes, there are lots of other wildlife that may try to get to your chicken coop or get to the chicken neighborhood and have breakfast or lunch out of what you've been taking care of. So these are things that you want to be careful about and make sure you protect your chicken areas either with the embedded uh, expanded metal, as I mentioned before, or even electric fences, or even lines that may go across, crisscross overhead on the areas where your chickens are kept. Within the coop, there are all certain features that you, you need to have. As your chickens grow older, you bring them outside. In the chicken house, on the coop, you want to have, definitely want to have a roosting rod or a couple of them. You want to have a tray at the bottom of the roosting rods because on the roost is where this chickens usually sleep. And they have a pecking order. Every one of them has their own spot where they would stay. Now, as a chicken owner or as a backyard chicken manager, the tray where the droppings end up should be cleaned out every day. And you should want to look at this tray to see what poop is coming down because you can tell a lot about the health of your chicken and, and what should be the next step. Aside from the roost and the tray, you can see that they have the feeding facility there, drinking facility, and they have bedding material. This bedding material can be made out of wood shaving. Pine is a very good wood shaving bedding material that you may want to consider because it's very absorbent. Um, you may want to stay away from other types of uh, bedding material, uh, um, such as cedar wood, because of the simple fact that the chickens have a very simple and sensitive uh, uh, trachea system and they, the, the, the pine usually emits a fragrance or a chemical that is not very conducive to a healthy chicken upbringing. You can see the entrance on the far side of this picture, which is what you would use to clean out the, the bedding material. And what's not shown here is the fact that you also need to have a good ventilation system you get fresh air coming through and out of your coop. Another important thing is the laying box for your chicken. Once the chickens get to about five months, six months old, they, begin, they get to the point where they start laying eggs. And they always want to have a safe and comfortable place to lay their eggs where, where it will be dark, preferably dark and quiet, and they'll peacefully go there and lay the egg and walk away. And you want to come back in and get that from them. Of importance is the fact that the laying boxes should always be lined with some material that would help keep the egg or eggs from breaking. You don't want your egg to break and you want to remove your egg as soon as it is laid. The reason being that those chickens should never discover the beauty or the tasty the taste, tastiness of eggs because once they once one breaks and they taste it, they naturally begin to break the eggs themselves, and it's hard to take them away from that habit. So, you want to keep the eggs safe, you want to remove them as fast as possible before they become vulnerable to break. So once you get your basket of eggs, then you really want to keep them safe. Best to just wash them and keep them safe in a place where you can get to them or provide them to their to to your neighbors or wherever you may wish to share your eggs with. As mentioned earlier, there are different breeds, and each breed has its own area of speciality. And if eggs happen to be your primary need for having chickens, and here in this chart, you can see that your white, your white longhorn chicken produces about 280 eggs a year. And they lay about 
they start laying at about 16 weeks old, which is about four months. That's early. Comparable to your white longhorn is your barred Plymouth rock chicken. They also lay 280, about 280, 280 eggs per year. But they don't start till about 20 weeks, they're about 20 weeks old. But besides those comparable figures, look at the temperament. The barred Plymouth rock is a very calm chicken, whereas your white longhorn is very nervous and skittish and may not want to come to you with it. So having these characteristics under consideration may help you determine what type or what breed of chicken is best for you to have to meet, to meet your basic objective. Now, this is the point where if you have soft stomach, I would ask you to just turn away for a short while because we're going to talk about chicken poop. And yes, we've got to talk about chicken poop. They, 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 chickens poop a lot. But there's a lot you can learn from the chicken poop as well. And as I mentioned to you, the tray under your under the brood, the, the, the roosting rod is a palette that you can use to determine or identify if your chickens are getting sick or not. There are two types, two broad types of chicken poops. One is the regular one that comes out, another one that comes as a result of the food of the, the chicken food that goes into a separate compartment where it ferments and more nutrients is extracted away from. That which comes from the fermented section is kind of stinky, and we know that it stinks sometimes. And in some cases, you would see that it has like a slimy, glossy coat over it. There's nothing wrong with the chicken, that's just how the system is. You look closely at your, at your rooster board as well, you see other type of, of, of poops that have whitish color over them. The fact is that chicken's excretory system is only one and one only. And so the brick, they're, they're, they, they have the urea coming out in this form of a whitish coat around the, the, the poop. And that's nothing wrong with it. That's just how it would look. We're just making sure you know what they look like so you don't get yourself to worry. Another type would be just a runny type, which is a standard type which we see around in the backyard and in their area of, um, of hanging out. Now, if, you, if your face was turned, you can turn back because we're done with talking about poops. Now let's talk about the pollution potential of having chickens in your backyard. What I have here is a chart that shows various types of domestic animals um, and how they rate their waste, because the waste is a potential for, for, um, for pollution of our environment. The waste usually will have nitrogen, phosphorus, polish, it will have all kinds of salts, it will have the results of metabolic breakdown within the digestive system of this animal. But of note is the fact that some of these animals we're talking about are classified as having hot manure or cold manure. If you look at chicken specifically, you would realize it is chickens have hot manure. That's because they have a high content of nitrogen and well, minimum a high amount of nitri nitrogen. And then also they have some a relatively high amount of phosphorus as well. Whereas when you look at the horse, a horse has cold manure because its nitrogen content is relatively low and so does its phosphorus. The hotness, the heat of the, the hot term that's being used there is only because when you leave those things around, when you leave the waste around, they would compost and they would generate a lot of heat much much more than others would. And that's because they have hydrogen, nitrogen, complex nitrogen that breaks down, and the energy release is in the form of heat. Well, how do we manage our, our chicken waste? Obviously, if, it, if the ground in the pasture wouldn't bother too much about it, but if then the coop, when we're cleaning that tray out, we want to make sure we clean that regularly. It should be done on a daily basis done on a daily basis, and it's best to put it into a composting bin, which can be combined with your chicken waste, and do a compost, and have more compost together, and use in the garden, or give to a neighbor who will do the garden, and just enjoy the product of uh, the composted material. Another way of managing 
of chicken waste is by doing what's called pasturing, where the, the, the coop itself is one that moved from one location to the next, especially on a grassy area. What happens is the chicken would feed on the grass because they love to eat vegetation. As much as they, they, they would eat other things, they like, love to eat, eat grass uh, and some other types of vegetation. And as you move them around, the chick, the waste is distributed evenly over the pasture. And as they drop, leave their droppings behind, that is converted into nutrients for your grass to grow even better. Um, so it's advisable to move them on a daily basis before they really tear up the pasture and into a new location that would also benefit from their droppings. Another management style is called in situ compost. And we'll talk about that more. But it's a case where, as you can see, the chickens are cooked up in a, in a coop where they spend a good portion of their time and they just, the droppings stays with the bedding material and more, more bedding material is added. I also want to talk about a special, each, a special situation that may arise with Backyard chicken managers who live in families. What you see here is a, is a vicinity map of a neighborhood. The red line is the property line of the property I want to use as an example. And the yellow, yellow blocks you see there are just the, the homes and maybe the backyard shed and maybe the smallest ones the chicken coop. Of significance is the green shaded area that's on the western side of this red figure, red line figure. That is called the Chesapeake Bay Resource, the green hash area, it's called the Chesapeake Bay Resource Protection Area. And that's an environmentally sensitive area that is marked off by the county around permanent water bodies. Blue line you see here is a permanent stream. That is a stream that just flows continuously through most of the year, otherwise known as a perennial stream. So with that perennial stream, you have this resource, this green area that's called the resource protection area, or commonly RPA. To minimize the purpose of that green area is to actually filter pollutants or pollution that are in runoff to keep it away from getting into that perennial stream and into a Chesapeake Bay. As a result of that, there are restrictions within that RPA. One of them has to do with the fact that you should not have your chicken coop within that RP, within that resource protection area. You should not be composting your chicken waste within that protection area. Your chicken activities should be kept out of it so you can minimize the impact on the vegetation and that way you can enhance the filtration potential for the vegetation that is within the, within the resource protection area. So again, no composting or piling up waste within that sensitive area. No active gardening. Don't put your chicken, your garden in there. So well, I'm going to be adding my compost material there. It should not be within the limits of the resource protection area. And nutrient application is discouraged. So again, don't go applying your composting material thinking that, well, it would help the plants. The plants that are within your RPA should be native plants and should be should not be given too much fertilizer because they can nutrients because they can do without that. Now we're talking about the common chicken diseases and biosecurity. We want to hone in on the diseases as such because we're not we're not vets. But as a common as a homeowner, as a backyard chicken management operator, um, I want to highlight some of the things that you should identify in your chickens to let you know. But there is a problem. Chickens are very communal. They like to move together. They have the pecking order, but they like to move together as one. Spend most of the day just scratching, eating, and clucking. But if you observe anyone beginning to isolate itself, staying away from the from the batch of from the flock of chickens, if you observe some degree of inactivity, which is not usual, they're always very active, doing this or that, clucking or just doing stuff around the yard all day long. If you observe they're not eating well, they have poor appetite. If you observe deteriorating feature, physical features, such as they're losing some of the feathers, they're, they're, they're not walking straight, they're, 
the, the growths around the beaks or around the eye. These are indications that your chicken or chickens may be having some kind of disease. And your first move should be to get them to the vet as soon as possible. Because what, identify, for what person is to identify is to isolate them and then get them to the vet as soon as possible. Now, when it comes to biosecurity, what we're talking about here is how can you prevent diseases, those diseases from getting to your chickens or getting to human beings or diseases leaving your, your coop to go to your neighbor's coop. So there are some very simple and basic steps that you can take to make sure you to make sure you don't have this uh, um, disease disease transfer taking place. All the steps I've highlighted here include limiting human traffic. So if you have a friend that has chickens, discourage that friend from coming into your chicken coop to 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 see how your your coop looks, how your chicken management operation. Goals. Discourage him or her from doing that. We can stand from afar and point to them. If they must go in to see what it is probably giving them advice, then encourage them to put on clothes, shoes that they don't usually put on into their own chicken coop at home. If you must bring out, if you must, you can bring out a chicken, a chicken from the, your coop, from your batter, from your flock, to him or her, say, hey, here's what I'm talking about, what he but try to isolate your chickens by limiting human traffic. You must keep the air clean. Your draw out tree, clean those, wash those. Your drinking trough, wash them. Your, 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 and when you wash them, you can use dilution of vinegar and water to clean those things well. Do routine monthly cleaning of your chicken coop just to keep the chickens healthy. Also, keep feet away from wildlife. Wherever you, you store your wildlife or wherever the, wild, the chickens have the feed, don't allow wildlife to get close to because wildlife is another vector for chicken diseases. Not bringing chicken home when you go to visit your friends. Don't go visit her, his or her own chicken coop and say, oh, let me tell you what I'm doing. Stay away. If you, if you have to visit and go look at the stuff when you get home, make sure you clean your shoes, wash your hands, uh, um, change your clothes before you get into your own, into your own coop or into your own uh, um, chicken yard. Also, the moment you identify a bird as being sick, try to isolate that bird from the rest of the others. So if there's a disease, you would isolate the, the bird with the disease before it spreads onto the others. Now, there, there, are, there is free laboratory services that you can get through the department, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. These um, these services include necropsy services, and all that is is if you lose a bird, you can call them up and they'll tell you how to preserve the carcass, and you'll send it to them or you take it to them, and they'll determine the cause of death. Necropsy is to me to me is almost similar to autopsy, and all this is being done on animals, and they'll do certain tests to make sure to determine what killed that bird. So if there's any reason for them coming to quarantine the other birds or begin to inform the neighborhood of the potential of a particular disease, they'll be happy to do that before it spreads over. They will also do bacteriological and parasitological screening um, for your birds in case you observe one of them getting sick. And to get more information, you, would cut, you can contact the Warrington um, Regional Laboratory, which is operated under the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. My telephone number being 804-786-2483. So here's an interesting part that most people don't talk about when they want to have chickens. I refer to it as the afterlife decisions. It's not always best to talk about, but it's good to talk about. And when I refer to afterlife, I'm talking about the case where you have the birds specifically for egg production. 
the bird, the, the lifespan of egg producing birds is oh, about three to five years, about three years they begin to reduce the number of egg production. And at five years, they probably stop producing eggs. And then you've had this, this bird as your friend, as a family member, as your pet for five years, sometimes seven, some of them maybe not even eight years old. So what do you do with this chicken at that point? No more it is being produced. Think about it. Then you, but you're still buying feed for this chicken. And this chicken is there still bossing around you a new flock that you may now have this producing eggs for you. The choice is, yes, I'm going to keep this forever. That's the grandfather of my, of my babies or grandmother, the mother of my babies. Or do you want to make the tough decision where you transition it into the freezer stage? At that point when the chicken is five years old, they're not very tasty for for grilling. They may be good for stewing or for making uh, chicken broth out of it. But you should also remember, can you, is your community, does your community allow you to transition that bird into the other stage? And worst of all is, during the time you have this bird as a pet, if you would call this bird Molly, because your, da your daughter's best friend at school was called Molly, now the daughter, the friend has moved to another state, and so your daughter wants to have another Molly as her best friend, there will be a problem for you to transition that chicken. That's why I think chickens, if they had to be called, be given names, they should be called things like teriyaki, like grilly, <laughs> like stewy. So when they get to the freezer, they say, oh, this is stewy, and it's a lot easier to get up. But I'll tell you another thing that you can do at this stage is, once you start having chickens, it's good to have another friend who may live a mile away or so not very far away. So when this afterlife, which is the chicken, cannot produce eggs anymore, you figure, well, what do I do with this chicken? You can take this chicken over to your friend and you can just switch your own with his or her own and it'd be a fair trade. That's the easy part. The other parts when the chicken gets to a point where it gets attacked by wildlife and gets killed. So what you want to do is, if you live in Fairfax County, you're allowed to bury your animals on your property. But in doing that, you must ensure that the amount of, once you dig the hole, the amount of soil that should be over that bird should be at least two feet thick in, in depth, because you don't want wildlife to go dig up that bird, the remains of that bird, and start messing around. Additionally, the bottom of that burying hole should be above, should be two feet above the average water table and on your property. So that means you cannot be burying your bird within that RP we talked about. You can be burying your body, your bird in an area where you have that high water table because that's not right. And for you to have an advice on how deep that water table may be, uh, you may need to know what soil type you have and see what characteristic depth the water table. Uh, you may have that soil type. Finally, if you if your when your bird if your bird dies of old age, then you, the burial takes place. But if it dies suddenly, you also want to contact um, your the laboratory to make sure they do tests to find out what happened and what caused the death of um, of your bird of your favorite bird. So I went to um, cartoon stop the common. I saw this cartoon where two chickens were talking about an egg, and the one said, "Why? This is a cute. They're cute at that age, aren't they?" With that, I would wrap up, and I would try to open some questions to see if I can ask some questions based on what uh, what's been going on during the presentation. Perfect, Willie. Thank you so much for your presentation. We did get a couple of questions. The first one is a two-parter. Are snakes a concern in regards to chickens? And then how do you deter snakes from getting to your chickens? That's a good question. Snakes are one of the wildlife uh, um, critters that we should keep an, keep an eye for. And, you know, there are different ways of one can manage to control snakes. and. Um, if you go to say one of our hardware stores, they have what's called snake begone, because I used I've used it in my property before. 
and that's one thing you can use if you can do if you have abundance of snakes in your property. Um, but other than that, they're, they're also very tricky animals. It's hard to point out, so, well, this is the one golden answer to take care of snakes. But if you have, I also know that if you have larger chickens and the snakes are small, believe it or not, those chickens are so protective of the flock, they attack the snakes and they, they, they've been known to kill small snakes. We know there are code regulations regarding how many chickens you can keep and where you can keep them. We had a question about the chicken shelters or the housing structures. I'm wondering if there's any regulations as to how large they can be, where you can move them, or what kind of structures you need to have for your chickens. Yeah, so uh, that's why I said before I'm not an expert, but I know there are certain distances from which your, your structure should be from the property line side side property line and front property line and back property line. I would encourage you to go to that telephone number which we mentioned earlier, which let me just flash back and see if I can get to it. And call that number and they'll give you exactly the exact specifications for it. Especially with this type of zoning that you may have. Uh, the zoning is what dictates Is that 703-324-1300? It sounds like it, yes. Yes, yes. Because in the zoning of your parcel or your property is what the, uh, um, the distance and the restriction limitations of structures within the property, uh, um, within your property. And we have another viewer who noted that we have extremely cold winters in Virginia. So what do we do to maintain chickens during these extreme temperatures? So initially, when you get your, if, if you get your chickens, like young, a day old from the hatchery, expected to have a lamp, a lamp warmer over the brooder. But even when you take your chickens, when they have grown to a point, you take them out about five or six weeks, and you begin to have those cold nights. You really want to have a heat lamp within the within the the the, strap, the coop that you have. And the chickens themselves know that if it gets to be too warm, they'll move away from that heat lamp. And if it gets to be too cold, you'll see them huddling under the heat lamp. That is a, that's a good question. Um, I think that is more also very vital when you have your chicks mule. Because when you have the chicks mule, they're required to have heated brooder of about 90 to 95 degrees uh, um, in temperature. And the way you would know whether it's too hot for them or too or, or cold for them, you will see them either move towards the lamp or move away from the lamp. That's a good thing to, 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 to note. And so it would go out with that. It would, same would apply when you go out and it gets to be cold and you can use that. I must say though, that once the chicken are old enough, they usually don't need those lamps. They have the way of coming together themselves on that roosting rod, which we talked about, roosting pole we talked about, and they huddle together, and the usual will survive. But if you think, no, my gosh, it's going to be too cold, then you can put on that heat lamp and watch them either come close, which you know is a benefit to them, or move away, which you know, well, they don't need this lamp. So that's an indication for you, the property owner, or the, or the operator. Now we had someone else say that they were interested in having chickens, but they didn't want to have to deal with composting the waste. So are there any companies that will haul manure from their property in Fairfax County? I don't know of any that would do specifically chicken waste. I know of some that may do more waste of bigger volume, like horse waste. And I think the reason why the would chicken is not a big demand or potential business to get into in this area is because we have most we mostly have backyard chickens which doesn't produce enough volume to, be, to justify that kind of business however if you live in a more rural area where you have bigger operations yes there are people who will take chicken waste and will add them to their waste management system and produce fertilizer for use even in other areas that are outside the scope the area of where the manure is produced. But here in Fairfax, I'm not quite familiar with any, but you know, we can always double check on that. 
through the internet and see if there's any company, small mom and pop operation that would be willing to do that kind of stuff and probably use it in their backyard or sell it to somebody else who may be running a garden, urban garden. Are chickens noisy? Chickens are really not noisy. They spend all the day just scratching around. Then they cluck, cluck around and, and that's what they're doing. The only time they may get a little noisy is after they've laid their eggs. And they have the victory, victory song, as we say, and you know, oh, there must be another egg, let's go get the egg. The, the roosters are the more noisy ones, and I believe that's part of the reason why they're not allowed to think that it's coming unless you live in an agriculturally zoned territory. The chickens are usually very peaceful. You may hear them once in a while, but especially if they see, if there's a perceived threat, you would hear the leader of the pack give a loud cry, continuous loud cry, just to let the other members of, of her pack know that there is something, there's something, some danger looking around. Let's go in for shelter so we go in for it. That's the only time you probably see the noise when there's a threat around. For those of us who would never name our chickens Nugget, mm -hmm. because they would be our best friends and not our food, I'm kind of wondering if chickens get along well with any other pets, and if so, which ones? We saw a really cute picture of the puppy. Yes, oh, my yes, dog, like my yes, yes, yes. They do. The chickens are very friendly. Friendly. They can be very friendly animals, and if you bring them up right with the with the all the pets in the house, they grow up very well. They get along well, as, as mentioned earlier. They can have they can those the operation between chickens and bees are very compatible. You have horses, what's the traditional practice to have horses and chickens, the chickens with you know, all the scraps. They get along with, well with dogs, they come and cozy, on, cozy up with the dogs, and even cats they would be. So it's just the way you bring them up. Some of them could be very skittish and may not cozy up as you like them. But others are naturally calm and friendly. They would be friendly with the rest of your animals, and even with your kids, and with the rest of your family. And I think for our last question, let's see if, you know, imagining that someone watching this webinar, it's the very first time they ever learned about keeping backyard chickens and all they're fascinated and they're ready to get started, but they only have the information you provided them with today. What other little tips and tricks do you have as a last going away message for someone who really wants to start having backyard chickens? Yeah, I think the one important thing, which I probably didn't mention because that was right in the realm of what I was talking about, is timing. For instance, someone gets excited and I thought, oh my gosh, I'd love to have this particular breed and that's what I want to have because I love to have the eggs and I want to have the calmness, etc., etc." et cetera. By the time you go to a hatchery to purchase a chicken, especially about this time of the year, you'll find out the popular breeds are not available. The, proper, the popular ones and the unique ones are not available anymore because you really have to put your order in, say, back in October. With the hatchery, say, hey, I'd like to have this number of whatever breed you, you choose to have. So that's the important thing. You want to you got to time it right. And it's not something you want to just jump into. There are several times you have to put it in place. You have to talk to your neighbors. Say, hey, I think I have a chicken. What do you think? You have to make sure your homeowner association allows you to have that. And if you make if you don't meet the requirements, you have to now begin to apply for the special permit. We could be able to have it. So if you want to have chickens, you want to set, give yourself quite a few months before you order. And the best time to order your chicken is that is back like in October or November and have it delivered to you about this time. Because when the, those chickens grow after four weeks or five weeks, you want to take them out. So you want to have the weather as warm as it is today or about this week. So they would feel cozy and they would thrive where you don't have to take out the, the heat lamp with you. Because they do well, they want to, they want to run around, they want to play around. So, you want to make sure you get them the timing is right for them to start um, scratching and doing what they do best. Now, that's if you have, if you want to order chicks, which we talked about. If you don't want to order chicks, you want to have live chickens, then yeah, now you can go to some farmer, farmer that hopefully you know that brought up the these or her chickens well and just purchase. A laying chicken from, from that farm and bring them home. When you bring them home, you got to make sure you have your the thing you want to think about. You want to have your 
um, your rooster, ready, your, your chicken coop ready, want to have some feed ready. Because you, you, as soon as the chicken gets them, you got to start feeding them. And feeding the right food that they would, that would help them grow, being in continuity with them. So basically, timing is the thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you so much for joining us with our webinar today. Willie, thank you so much for your presentation. That was really great. And I'm sure everyone has really learned a lot about backyard chicken management. Oh, it's been fun. And if you're interested, if you have some other questions, feel free to contact us. We have our um, telephone number there that you can use to contact us. And you can also send us um, email messages. And we'd be more than happy to reply and provide additional information that you may, that may be more, more specific to you. But enjoy your chickens. And if you're thinking about it, keep thinking and planning and do it right. Perfect. Thanks so much, Willie. And everybody, go ahead and have a great day. Next week, we'll be having a presentation called Don't Call It Dirt, The Amazing World of Soil, which will be presented by Dan Short, our soil scientist. And that's sure to be just as great as this presentation was. Thank you very much, and have a great day.